Scripture reading for this morning is found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 27 through 31. Isaiah 40, 27 through 31. If you have one of the old chronological Bibles, it can be found on page 905. If you're using one of the new chronological Bibles, it can be found on page 902. And if you don't have a chronological Bible, there's a couple in the lobby. Feel free to take one on your way out. It is our gift to you. What we're doing is we're working through the Bible in a year, chronologically, and the week's message comes out of the reading for the week. So take advantage of this week because the old and the new ones are actually synced up pretty close for once. I think three pages is as close as we've been for quite some time. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 27 through 31, the word of the Lord says this. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men will stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we simply ask that you make this passage alive and real within us today. God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, I pray that you would work within us to that end. This is one of those passages that so many of us know and so many of us quote. But God, very few of us actually live out. So we simply ask that your truth become real in us today. And this truth is going to be different for us depending on where we're at in our faith journeys, depending on where we're at in our lives. And God, we simply want to meet with you. So join us together, unify us as a body, but mostly as believers in Christ, God. That we would just hear from you today, that we would experience you. I pray that our presence would decrease and that your presence would increase. That you would be honored and glorified and magnified in our lives. That our hearts would be set on fire towards you. That we would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you love us, that you care for us. That you want the best for us. God, be present in our midst today for your honor and glory and for your kingdom purpose, we pray. Amen. Children are now dismissed to go to Children's Church. I would encourage you, if you uh, are on the fence about, to stick around for lunch afterwards and and just have a good time. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Since this whole COVID thing started, we've been looking for a reason and a time to get together, and today is that time. So... Just stick around if you got the opportunity. If not, that's fine too. Um, This is a passage most of us probably recognize. It's funny, as I was in my office this morning rehearsing things, I looked up on the wall, I'm like, oh yeah, I've got a poster on my wall with a picture of an eagle and this very verse, Isaiah 40, 31. We'll be speaking on a little bit more than that, but most of us have heard this at some point. In our culture in general, we kind of have a fascination with eagles, don't we? Like... If you're driving down the road, well, hopefully not if you're driving down the road, but say you're sitting somewhere and looking at the sky and you see an eagle flying, what do you do? You stop whatever you're doing and you stare at the thing. The first, the other thing, the next thing I do is I tend to look around for whoever I can tell, right? Hey, there's an eagle, you got to come look at it. And even if I am driving and see one on occasion, I will pull off and watch it. And it's not just that we see them, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of like as a country, we're almost fascinated with them. Since 1782, an eagle has been the official bird of the United States of America. Right? It's chosen for its long life, its great strength, and its majestic looks. But it goes a lot more than that. Right? Our local university is named what? The Bald Eagles. Philadelphia NFL franchise is named after this very bird. I don't know if there's significance there or not, but it seems like there should be. Right? One of the most successful wartime aircraft ever released by the United States military was the F-15 Eagle. A scout is somebody that goes through the Boy Scouts of America, and the highest rank you can achieve is that of an 
Eagle Scout. One of the most widely known international fraternal organizations is the Fraternal Order of Eagles. Right? J.R.R. Tolkien, when he wrote his Lord of the Rings trilogies, the biggest symbol of strength and might, or one of them, is the great eagles in his books. They were powerful and almost untouchable. And then there's my favorite example, a guy named Michael Edwards. Does anybody have any idea who Michael Edwards is? Yeah, my children do. Michael Edwards grew to fame during the 1988 Calgary Winter Olympics. He grew to fame... And most of you are going, hey, how famous can he be? I don't even know who he is, right? If you have Disney, uh, Disney Plus, they actually have a film out right now about this guy and his name. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. He was a ski jumper for Great Britain. The first ski jumper for Great Britain. He was not a good ski jumper at all. In fact, he wasn't very much of an athlete at all. He was slow. He was unathletic. He tried doing it in track. It didn't work. But his goal was to make the Olympics. And he figured that since they didn't have a ski jumping team, all he had to do was meet the minimum requirements, and then he could be Olympian for Great Britain in a ski jump. And that is exactly what he did. Guys, this guy had to wear his glasses because he was so far-sighted he couldn't see without them, which is kind of interesting when you're going down a hill at Lord knows how fast and jumping through the air at Lord knows how far. But when he would put his goggles on over his glasses, they would begin to immediately fog up so that when he jumped he could barely see what he was doing right he finished dead last in both the 70 meter and 90 meter jumps in the 1988 Olympics but he was an Olympian and what was his nickname Eddie the Eagle Eddie the Eagle right Eagles pervade our society in many ways and most of us probably even have stories about Eagles I can still remember one of my closest experiences with an eagle. Actually, it was a pair. It was one time I was running, going for a run. This would be seven years ago, probably, along the edge of the woods behind the Cedar Springs Cemetery right out here. And I was on my run, and when I get to that point in my run, I knew I only had about three-quarters of a mile left, and most of it was downhill, and I'm hot, I'm sweaty, I'm ready to get done. So you're just focused on the end goal at that point. And I heard this flapping of right above my head. I stopped. I looked at the trees. There's nothing there. I looked the other direction, and two mature adult bald eagles had both been sitting in this branch literally, what, 25, 30 feet above my head as I ran right underneath them and didn't pay attention, but I stopped what I was doing to watch them both just soar across the field there over into the mountains. I was captivated by it, right? You probably have your story. I love talking to Earl and Sue Beam because every time I talk to them, Sue gives me an update on their Pine Creek project. You know, they're, they're, they're a lot up there in Pine Creek and the eagle activity that's going on. And maybe you're thinking, Pastor Scott, get on with it. All you're doing is talking about eagles this morning. You're a little bit obsessed, right? It's possible, right? But the imagery that this passage of Scripture gives us in relation to eagles is very poignant. There's a lot of relevance to it and to our lives. See, Scripture states that those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength and they will mount up on wings like eagles. Guys, does that get your blood pumping just a little bit as a follower of Christ? Because I think it should. I think you should be excited by this passage. I think you should be inspired by this passage. The reason is very simple, and I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, and I don't think I'm going to be the bearer of bad news, because if you haven't figured this out already in your life, then you're not going to figure it out. But guys, guess what? Life is tough. It doesn't always work out the way we want to. About the only predict predictable thing in most of our lives is unpredictability. Unless you're a fan of the Philadelphia Phillies. Then you can pretty much predict with absolute certainty that their bullpen will blow the predicted save as happened last night, as soon as the Garmin family turned on the television. If you need any more help on this concept, all I would challenge you to do is work on a plumbing project in your house. What should be simple and easy, no matter how it looks, will turn out to be five times greater than you expect it to be. You will make multiple trips to the hardware store. It doesn't matter how well you prepared you think you are. Isaiah wrote this passage. We're reading now the prophet Isaiah today. Isaiah was a prophet ordained by God to speak to his people. 
These people weren't in a good place. They were facing the consequences of turning their backs on God, of years of bad kings and bad leadership and bad behavior on their part. Kind of like this roller coaster ride, up, down, up, down, up, down. And God chose Isaiah to deliver this message. Now, the book of Isaiah covers much ground. In the beginning, it's a little rough. Here's what Isaiah says to the people. Uh, Isaiah says to the people that God gave him. He says, instead of fragrance, there will be a stench. Instead of a, sla a sash, a rope. Instead of well-dressed hair, baldness. I think that's a little unnecessary personally, but... <laughs> Instead of fine clothing, sackcloth. Instead of beauty, branding, your men will fall by the sword, your warriors in battle. The gates of Zion will lament and mourn. Destitute, she will sit on the ground. Life as a prophet was not easy. Isaiah was given this task by God, and it wasn't always fun. It was harsh words by God towards these people. Think about the lives of some of the other prophets that God ordained and God set out. Think the life of Moses was easy? I mean, I use Moses a lot because a lot of the Old Testament is about him or written by him. We've read through most of it already. What was life like for Moses? Life was so bad for Moses that after he led God's chosen people out of 400 years of slavery, they begged to go back into it. Right? Free. But yeah, it's not very good here. Let's go back into the slavery. Well, things were much better. How about Elijah? Scripture says that Jezebel, the queen, hated him so bad that she sought him out in order to kill him. Jezebel's husband, Ahab, who was the king at the time, had this meeting with another a king. Ahab was the king of Israel. Uh, Jehoshaphat was the king of Judah at the time. And Ahab said, we've got to get together and form this military alliance. And Jehoshaphat said, I think we need to inquire of the Lord first. We need to get God's direction on this. Okay, he says, is there any prophet around here that we can speak about or speak to? And Ahab's kind of like, ah, I don't know. And Jehoshaphat said, no, we've got to find a prophet. Prophet of the Lord we can acquire of. And what's Ahab's response? He says, there is still one man through whom we can acquire, inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. That was the life of Micaiah. Right? How about Zechariah? We don't talk about Zechariah much, one of the latter prophets of the Old Testament. He was actually given inspirational words by God to speak to the people. Here's what he says. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless or the alien or the poor. In your hearts, do not think evil of each other. And how did the people respond to this message? Scripture tells us this. They refused to pay attention. Stubbornly, they turned their backs and stopped up their ears. They made their hearts as hard as flint and would not listen to the law or to the words that the Lord Almighty had sent by His Spirit through the earlier prophets. So the Lord Almighty was very angry. John the Baptist was what? Beheaded in prison. Jesus Himself was beaten, tortured, crucified, hung on a cross. Scripture states that Peter, one of his followers, followed him to the very end. And history states that Peter was crucified upside down. What do we know about Isaiah? Well, it doesn't tell us in, this, in the Bible, but scripture or history states that Isaiah was actually experienced death by being sawed in two. Cut in half. This is the life of a prophet. It wasn't always easy. Puts some of our problems into perspective, though, doesn't it? Simply put, life is hard and life is unpredictable. It won't always turn out the way that we think it should. I can attest to this. The last three years of my life have not gone remotely close. Not even remotely close for how it was supposed to go. It wasn't. Life-altering physical limitations. Funerals that shouldn't have happened. They just weren't supposed to. COVID. Seriously? Right? Even today, we're supposed to be meeting out there. And yet, here we are. These can often make us become tired and weary. And guys, I know that I'm not alone when it comes to this. You start questioning. You start wondering. You feel exhausted at times. 
not just in your body, but fatigue of the soul as well. That's why this passage is so important. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. You know, so often in our lives, our tendency, when we are faced with difficulties and when we are faced with rough spots in our lives, is to turn inwards, to withdraw ourselves from the world. We don't want others to see our pain. We don't want them to see our shortcomings. We don't want them to see our struggles. But when we do this, the offset is that we often tend to turn away from God as well. You know, according to Barna, Barna did this study, Barna Research Group did this study. It was a 20-year study on a church attendance in America. Okay? Started right around 2000. So it was just released in 2020. According to Barna Research, here's what they found. Church attendance has dropped over the last 20 years. Anybody surprised? Here's how it goes by generation. Generation Z... If you don't know what Generation Z is, Generation Z are those born between 1997 and 2012. You're not important enough, so we don't have numbers on you. Just kidding. You're not important enough because the study was actually started on or before when you were born, so you're not practically included in this. Millennials, those born between 1981 and 1996, have dropped from 32% to 25% church attendance. Gen X, best generation, rock on. Those born between 65 and 80, Dropped from 34 to 29%, which I am proud to say is the least amount of droppage. Boomers, you guys are good to go, right? Those born between 1946 and 1964, actually, you've dropped from 45% to 32%, 13 percentage points. And those over that age, anyone born before 1946 who are referred to as elders in this study, have dropped from 51% to 37% church attendance. So guys, these numbers are actually pre-COVID numbers. These are not post-COVID numbers. Declining church attendance is not medical. It's cultural. It's societal. Now, with that being said, let's be abundantly transparent that COVID has certainly not helped in this area at all either. Barna included in this study their findings that one in every three Christians in America has stepped away from regular church attendance over the last year and a half. One in every three. And what's worse than that, the sad news reveals this. Those no longer attending church, they found out, bear more emotional burden in their life. Respondents who have stopped attending church during COVID-19 are less likely than their peers who are still attending the same church during the pandemic to agree with the statement, I am not anxious about my life as I have an inner peace from God. Practicing Christians who have stopped attending church are more likely than all other practicing Christians to say they feel bored all the time or that they have felt insecure for at least some of each day. Let's be honest, the news in our world has been largely pretty rough for quite some time now and it's taken its toll on our lives and the lives of those in our world around us. But do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. The creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired and weary and his understanding no one can fathom. How often do you hear that message on the news? It's a message that should cause us to pause and take wonder and inventory in our relationship with God. It's a message that should, should cause us to hear hope and excitement. I believe it's a message that should get our blood pumping because it's a message that has direct relevance to each and every one of us in our lives. I like to say it's an Old Testament message with a New Testament twist. I say this because it, it's got a bit of a Sermon on the Mount feel to me. Right? Isaiah says he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Guys, when we assume 
a posture of humility before God in our lives, Jesus then says we will be blessed. When we assume a posture of humility before God in our lives, Jesus says we will be blessed. When we are some of our mentally, emotionally, physically, lowest points in our lives, Jesus calls us blessed. How can this possibly be? I believe it's because during these times we are forced to lean on God as our source of strength and comfort. I mean, who do you turn to when there's nowhere else to turn? And do not say Ghostbusters. Right? When we realize that all we are and all we have comes from God and God alone, our attitude and our posture will resemble the kind of instrument that is both pliable and malleable, the, the lump of clay that God can form in his desired instrument in his hands. I think the Apostle Paul understood this greater than most. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Verses 7 through 10, Paul start talk, he's talking about this thorn in his flesh, this thorn in his side that God has given him that keeps him from becoming conceited. Here's what Paul's saying. He's basically saying, I've had these real intimate and real powerful experiences with God. And because of that, I have a tendency to get a big head, but God has given me this thorn in my flesh to keep me grounded, to keep me from getting a big head. Now, nobody knows exactly what this thorn in the flesh was. He never reveals it. Scripture never reveals it. Theologians have debated about it and, and, and argued about it for, for years. He refers to it as a, a messenger of Satan sent to torment him. So my only deduction is that he must be a Dallas Cowboys fan because I can't come up with anything else. Right? Hopefully Mark's watching online. In all seriousness, what was this stumbling block that God put before Paul? Three times I plead with the Lord to take it away from me. He says, but he, God, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. For that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and in difficulties, because when I am weak, then I am strong. When Paul's presence diminishes, God's presence through Jesus Christ increases. And we sit here, we nod our heads, we go, Amen, brother, we may not say it, but I'm sure you're thinking it, Right? We mostly sit in affirmation of that passage in 2 Corinthians, which leads me to ask the simple question, why don't we more often live like it? Why don't our lives reflect the truths of 2 Corinthians 12 and Isaiah chapter 40 more often? Why don't we live as though when we are weak, that is exactly when we are strong? Not because of who we are, but because of who God is within us. When we are barely glowing, the light of truth found in the love of Christ is shining its brightest in our lives. Why don't we live that way? And the answer that I've come up with is actually twofold. Because of our pride and our feelings, which are intimately intertwined with one another. We tend to seek God's approval for our agenda in our lives. Right? We, we want to say, God, here's where I'm going. Please place your stamp of approval and your stamp of affirmation on what I believe your will to, for my life to be instead of going, God, what is your will for my life? And I struggle with this just as much as you do. Right? For those of you who don't know or who you're not sure about, like, yeah, I've been here 10 years. Unfortunately for you, I just signed another five-year contract. Right? <laughs> I've got five more years up here, and there's not much you can do to get rid of me. Right? There probably is, so don't look too hard into it. But here's the thing. I bring this up because I honestly have zero desire to move away from here. 
this would be a terrible time for me to relocate my family. I've got a daughter going into 12th grade, a daughter going to 11th grade, and a son going into 7th grade. I absolutely love and adore living up here. I love this church. I love you guys. That sounds really cheesy and corny, but I mean it from the bottom of my heart. I love this church, and I love this church body. So what's my natural tendency? It's to be like, God, I want to stay. Please approve it. Right? Did I, do I really actively seek God's will? And going, God, I will follow wherever you choose to lead, even if it's away from Cedar Heights? Or do I approach him with an agenda? I want this illusion of control. What I'm getting at is, we, we don't often like to cede our lives to God's will as much as to ask Him to conform to our desires and our feelings. I mean, isn't that the sexuality debate going on in our nation right now? And I'm not talking about the debate you think I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the homosexual rights or the transgender rights or all the issues that you see politically pasted all over the, the, the headlines day in and day out. I'm talking about the warped, overall, counter-biblical view that we have in this country towards human sexuality. It's pervaded our culture, and I would dare even say it's pervaded the church. Why do I bring that up? Because your feelings are not the pinnacle of your existence. That's what that whole argument is based around. Your feelings are not the pinnacle of your existence. If you are living for your feelings, you're living for yourself, and you're not fulfilling the purpose for which you were created or ordained by your creator. 1 John chapter 3, 20, God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Proverbs chapter 28, he who trusts himself is a fool. <laughs> How about that one? He who trusts himself is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom is kept safe. Proverbs 3, 5, most of you know this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and what? Do not lean on your own understandings. Proverbs 29, a fool gives vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. So what is wisdom? According to Psalm 111, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. Job himself says in Job 28, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding. Do those passages that I just quoted from the scripture match the definition of wisdom and understanding that would be universally accepted in our world by and large? Not really. Not really. So which one do you choose to live by? Which one do you choose to live by? The wisdom of the world or the wisdom of our God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. And what? His understanding no one can fathom. God desires to indwell within you, to live within you, for your strength and well-being according to his kingdom purposes. And if we choose to live for our own good, if we choose to live for our own purpose, then we are living antithetically to the purpose for which we are created. We're living in opposition to why God created us in the first place. And if that's the case, guess what? You will never find true contentment in your life. This, this faith in God through, through Christ his son thing is not a decision that you can make and then leave it when it gets uncomfortable or out of your comfort zone or inconvenient for you and your feelings. It's part of who you are. In fact, it is who you are. It's a decision that must pervade every aspect of your life. You see, when that's the case, then your life will point towards him and how you live it. Let me ask you this question. You ever spent, you ever been in the woods at nighttime during a full moon? Preferably in the colder months. You see, it doesn't work so well if it's in the middle of July like we are right now, and it's a full moon and you walk out in the woods and there's a canopy above you because you can't see through the leaves. 
But I'm talking about, for me, it's usually during hunting season. Well, it's even better if it's in the winter when there's snow on the ground and the leaves are down and there's a full moon. Have you ever been in the woods at nighttime when there's a full moon and you don't need an artificial light source to see your way around? And I'm not talking about walking down a beaten path or a trail that's already there. I mean navigating through the woods without having an artificial light source. It's really cool. Like, I can't even describe it. It doesn't make any sense. But part of me, when I get out there, I go, it feels like I'm cheating nature somehow. Right? Because from the moment we wake up, we have light in our world. You know, you open your eyes in the morning and say you wake up at 3 o'clock. What do you do? You turn on the light or you go to the bathroom. You turn on the light there. You get in the hallway. You turn on the light there. We always have light in our world. But to be out in nature without an artificial light source and be perfectly content because you can see what's going on around you is something that is absolutely fascinating. Is it because of the moon, that the, the light that the moon is giving off that you can see all this? I mean, the moon is bright. But are you ever going to mistake the light of the moon compared to the light of the sun? They're two very different entities, aren't they? The sun gives off an incredible amount of light. How much light does the moon give off? None. None whatsoever. The only light the moon gives off is what it reflects off of the sun. Kind of like that rock, huh, Sue? Absolutely. Doesn't that play out in our faith as well? When we live out the truth that is found in this passage today, that is found especially in verses 28 through 30 and 31, isn't that exactly what we're doing in our lives? We're not operating on our own strength and on our own accord, but living according to the renewed strength that God has promised us. Living a life that is reflective of the glory of God through our thoughts and our attitudes and our actions. Living in a way that doesn't point others to us, but points others to God. Guys, when you live with a genuine hope in the Lord that comes from God, not from your own strength, others are going to be forced to reconcile with what they see in your life to how they see themselves, to what they've experienced. Do you realize that your life, even at its absolute lowest point, and maybe I should even say especially at its lowest point, may be the catalyst that God uses to point others to him. And even if it doesn't, doesn't this just sound like the best way to live? Doesn't this sound like an amazing truth for an amazing life? That those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, that they will mount up on wings like eagles, they will soar like eagles, they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. And guys, i got to be honest with you. It sounds stupid, and you've heard me say it before, but I teared up this morning in my office going over this thing. Most of you know I can't run anymore. It's been hard for me. It shouldn't be, but it is. I used to be able to run and not get tired for a long ways. Boy, what I wouldn't do to experience that again. To soar on wings like eagles. To run and not grow weary. To walk and not grow faint. But sometimes God has to take away things in our lives that we are holding as idols in front of him in order to reach us with a greater truth. Do you guys know how long it takes a baby eagle to fly? 10 to 12 weeks. 10 to 12 weeks. It's about the time a baby eagle leaves its nest. Where are the eagles' nests? Most of you know where the ones right off of 220 down here. Most of them are high up in the trees. Right? They sit up above high. Why? For safety, for protection. The eaglets can stay in the nest. The moms can bring, the dads can bring food back. But about 10 to 12 weeks is when an eagle starts to fly. How does it start to fly? It starts by imitating its parents. And so what it'll do is it'll get up in the nest and it'll puff out its wings when there is a wind going through and it'll hop up and down to get the feeling of what it's like to have wind rushing through its wings. And then it'll get back down. And it'll go through this sequence in this series often until it finally builds up the courage to walk to the edge of the nest. 
And guess what it has to do? Jump or step or fall or whatever it is that's going to get it out of the nest. And that's how, yeah, you can see the dad behind it, right? Get out of here. <laughs> and that's how it learns to fly. Is it pretty? Is it graceful? Is it beautiful? Absolutely not. An eagle's first flight is awkward and clumsy and usually ends in a crash landing near a water source nearby. It takes it days and weeks and months to learn to fly like its parents. But if it never takes that first step, what's going to happen? It's going to sit in the nest its whole life. Seriously, Dad, right, as a teenager, can you give me more food? Right, playing video games in the basement. I don't know what's going on. The eagle will never mature. It will never fulfill its God-given purpose if it doesn't what? Step out of the nest. Trust that it can do what it was created to do and imitate its parents. You see the symbolism here, right? God created you for a purpose and a reason. And if you never step out of the nest, trusting that he has your best interest in mind, that he will catch you when you fall. And if he doesn't catch you, he will let you fall. And then he will pick you up from that point by imitating Jesus Christ in his life on earth. <coughs> Guys, our, our knowledge of Christ can't just be head knowledge. It has to be experiential knowledge as well. Imitate Christ. Get into the Word. Follow His directive for your life. And allow God to mold you and shape you and form you into the instrument that He has designed you to be, not the instrument that you so desperately want to be on your own. And guys, sometimes those two match up very well, and other times it's not even remotely close. If you never step to the edge of the nest, if you never take that step, forget about flying. You'll never learn to soar. And isn't that what captures our attention when we see the eagle in the first place? Flying over our heads, the majesty of the creature. Take that jump and allow God to guide you today in your life. If you do, I can't guarantee the results but I can guarantee the faithfulness of the Father. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Lord, we come to you today asking for that courage in our life. Asking, asking that when we take that step that you will be there for us. Whether we're on the mountaintop right now or in the valley right now or probably somewhere in between, we want you to be honored and glorified. And God, it's hard to get rid of our personal agendas in favor of your desire and your will for our lives. But that's exactly what you've called us to do. And during the times that we are in the valley, during the times that we are low, you say that we are blessed. You say that there is strength for the weary and power for the powerless. So God, we ask that you remain true to your promise today, just as you were in the time of Isaiah. That these words would not lose their, their value to us, but that we would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they are true and that they are impactful and that you love us. Work through these words to transform our lives from the inside out for your kingdom purpose. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.